My name is Sue Skasky with Vermont Volunteer Services for Animals Humane Society and welcome to our show for the animals. Today we have a guest, Sherry Boys, and Sherry has been involved in training, breeding, and exhibiting and competing with dogs for 30 years. She's the past president of the Continental Herding Club, an all-breed herding club in Colorado and Wyoming. Sherry is also a past member of the Briard Club, am I saying that right? Mm -hmm. Of America, Havanese Club of America, St. Petersburg Dog Fanciers, it's an all breed dog club, Southwestern Florida Havanese Club, and the Colorado Kennel Club. She's shown dogs in AKC, which is the American Kennel Club, and ARBA, which is the American Rare Breed Association, mm -hmm. where she's championed Briards. Perinian Mastiffs. Perinian Mastiffs and Havanese. She's also competed in AKC Herding Trials, Obedience and Agility. She's bred Briards and Havanese. You say that dogs have been your hobby for many years and professionally you are a micromolecular biologist and work as a monitor for clinical trials of pharmaceuticals and medical devices. That's really impressive. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Welcome. Okay, so does your work in your professional field um, help you with a good insight into your subject for today? It, it does. I think my biology background um, probably weighs very heavily on some of the feelings that I have towards the behaviors of animals and the genetics of animals. Mm -hmm. Okay, that seems to make a lot of sense. Um, we came up with some questions, and <laughs> my little camera hog, um, selecting a dog breed that's right for you and finding a good breeder, that comes up so often because we know that we have some breeders out there that are only in it for the buck. Mm -hmm. So can you talk about that? Well, let's first um, take a look at selecting a, a dog breed. I think that many people don't put enough thought and or research into that question to, to begin with. Having been involved with dogs as long as I have over the years, many times I've had friends or co-workers or friends of friends or friends of co-workers approach me that, you know, the kids have been wanting a dog for mm -hmm. two years and now's the year we're going to fence the backyard and get the dog. And to approach that, the first thing I, I like to do is to find out if, if they're dead set on a, a purebred or if they, they have to have a puppy because we know our shelters are riddled with animals. And sure. any time that you can achieve two goals in one and having the pet for your family and saving a life, that's certainly the way to go. Do you know what the euthanasia rate is in America now? I do not. I don't either. I know when we... When I first started getting involved in animal rescue, it was something like 21 million healthy animals a year, which is just bizarre. And I have a feeling it's still in the low millions. Mm -hmm. Probably. So I always ask them, if, you know, are they dead set on having that purebred dog? Um, I remember one friend calling up and he, he wanted to get his family a boxer. And I asked him, well, why do you want a boxer? Well, he grew up with a boxer and he thought it was a good family pet. And um, boxers do make good pets. But my next question to him was, well, what are you gonna do with the boxer besides being your wonderful, loved family pet? Do you want to show? Do you want to do things like that? No, I just want a family pet. Well, then does it have to be a purebred boxer? And I offered to go with him to the shelters. We actually ended up finding a purebred in the shelters. and they were just as happy as can be. So that it's always the first place to look. Sure, and you know, the last statistic I heard is one third of every dog in the shelter is a purebred. Well, anymore, um, I certainly know, having lived in Florida recently, in states like Florida, uh, California, and um, Nevada, where you have very high incidence of foreclosures mm -hmm. on homes due to the bad economic downturn, those shelters are riddled with purebreds. Yeah. And, um, you know, that's just, it's not just a place where you're going to find 
the mixed breeds that you often can find the purebreds for that, especially in bad economic times like this. And most, if not all the shelters, and certainly all the reputable shelters, would have the dog already spayed, neutered, mm -hmm. vaccinated before adoption. Mm -hmm. so. so to look at how people approach um, what kind of breed they want, often, unfortunately, looks plays a primary reason for selecting a particular breed and that's about the last thing you should use as your indicator on what breed that you would like to have aside from a couple exceptions about looks and one would be size do you want a large dog or do you want a small dog and the other one might be grooming requirements there's a big difference between a bull mastiff and a rough coat collie mm -hmm. and the time that it'll take to groom but other than that um, I just hate to see people put too much emphasis on the look of a dog as opposed to looking at, at how that dog is going to fit into their lifestyle. Like for example, you may like German Shepherds, and German Shepherd is a very admirable breed, but do you do the kinds of things, the kinds of activities that will give that German Shepherd the exercise that it needs that that German Shepherd will be happy and healthy in your home and if you can't fulfill that then then you need to look at a breed that has less requirements for exercise um, another thing about a german shepherd would be the temperament they are kind of a dominant breed and um, you need to have a lot of you need to be you can't be an average pet owner i guess for some of the dom dominant breeds you need to have above average education and knowledge yourself about how to train dogs and in words we hear tossed around like alpha and pack leader mm -hmm. to success, be successful with those breeds and if you're a submissive person then you shouldn't get a German Shepherd you shouldn't get any of the Mastiff breeds and there's probably some terriers you shouldn't get are those mm -hmm. called bully breeds yeah okay yeah we just had Heather Bent from Potter's Angels do a show and she talked about bully breeds mm -hmm. They, you know, they need someone who can establish this, what we call the pack leader, mm -hmm. so that they know their place in the house, because these breeds are so independent and so intelligent, if there isn't a clear leader, they appoint themselves. Right. And then that's when they get in trouble. So, you know, maybe that Cocker Spaniel who's not going to do that, or that Golden Retriever who is another breed that's less likely to do that, might be the perfect dog for you. But those are the things that I like to see people think about, is your exercise and your ability and your knowledge that you know about training, or how much are you willing to learn about training. And if you're not willing or don't have the time to learn a lot about training, then why don't you get one of the breeds that are a lot easier to train. Makes sense. Mm -hmm. I remember years ago, um, somebody adopted a, um, a Dalmatian. Uh, high energy. High right? energy, yeah. and she couldn't understand why this dog always wanted to run and play and move, and mm -hmm. she wanted a submissive, you know, mm -hmm. couch potato. It's like, and that's also shortly before that, 101 Dalmatians came well, out. Well, exactly, and, and that started even before that, and, and I just, um, I have such a hard time with the media in this. And mm -hmm. When we were young children, it was Rin Tin Tin. Mm -hmm. And the German Shepherd became very, very popular. And the German Shepherd is not the dog for a first-time dog owner, nor is it the dog for the average pet owner household. Consequently, today, on any given day, there's about 125 German Shepherds in in shelters in Florida, there's about 250 in shelters in Texas, and I imagine there's even more in uh, places like um, California. Around when these dogs reach around 18 months to two years is when they become unmanageable, and these people realize that they have bit off more than they can chew, sure. and they they end up in the shelters. And then we had 101 Dalmatians, and then the same thing happened. Um, that dog became very popular. This is a high, high energy dog. And if you, if you aren't the kind of person who likes to go for a three to five mile run every morning, you should never even think about getting a Dalmatian. Same thing happened. The shelters are littered with them around the age of 18 months to two mm -hmm. years when they become unmanageable. 
back when I was very involved with Briards, um, the show Married with Children came out, and there was a Briard on there. Remind me what they look like. They're a large, shaggy, um, they're, they're a French sheepdog, and they have a very long coat, they have a tail, and they have prominent ears, kind of mouse ears. You may not have seen one, they're, they're still relatively rare. And when Married with Children started and there was a Briard on there, we all just cringed. Okay. Because we were so afraid that it was going to bring attention and popularity to the breed. Um, it did do some of that, but at, because the, Bri the Briard as a breed remained relatively expensive, mm -hmm. that stopped some of it. Uh, another example in the media, Hooch. Oh. Uh, that's a French, a French Bulldog. <laughs> or not a French Bulldog, French Mastiff. Mm -hmm. Popularity soared after the movie. And the Mastiff, again, is another one of those headstrong breeds that sure. needs someone who understands what alpha means, understands what establishing a pack leader means. And there's a lot of uh, the Mastiff breeds that are in the shelters because of that. Tell me, um, what sort of tools can someone use to select a breed that would best fit their lifestyle? Well, probably the best place to start is by looking at the breed standard. And if that is an AKC dog, then that can be found on the AKC websites. Or if it isn't an AKC dog, and just as another resource, all of the different breeds have breed clubs. And so you can, uh, Staffordshire Bull Terrier, just Google that and put Club of America, and it'll come up with the club. And that will have a breed standard, it's, and within that breed standard, then you should be able to see, they'll describe you know, not only the dog physically, but they will describe its temperament, and they'll des describe it what kind of exercise it needs, and also on, as another resource, this probably isn't always listed on the breed standard, but um, also on their website, you'll be able to access where it'll tell you what are some of the medical problems associated with that breed because all, all of our dogs do have medical problems. For example, um, yeah, we just, with my dog recently, she has a, or just got over a yeast infection <coughs> in her right ear mm -hmm. and after trying antibiotic it, that proved not to work because it was not bacterial, but she was put on Otomax and within a few days it cleared up. But she also has a bare spot underneath her neck where her folds of the skin mm. trap moisture. Mm -hmm. And since the Otomax, it has cleared up. So there are different, and I know Cocker Spaniels with your ears mm -hmm. often have problems. Mm -hmm. What other breeds, mm -hmm. what other symptoms? Hip dysplasia mm -hmm. is a big problem, particularly in the larger breeds, and even in some of the smaller breeds. Um, there's a relatively rare breed, it's called um, the Spanish Water Dog and it is like number two or three, and it's a smaller breed, you hate to see that. Um, but, and then there's um, a lot of eye diseases like retina detachment. Um, Cocker some, Spaniels, uh, right? Um, yeah, or my Havanese, that's something that runs in that breed. But you should be able to find a laundry list of the different medical conditions, and then that will key you in later on when you're looking for your dog is, that a good breeder is going to be testing for that and removing those dogs from the breeding program because that's how we keep the disease out. And even in some breeds that they don't have a high incidence of hip dysplasia, you'll find the good breeders are still having them x-rayed and get, there's an organization called OFA, which is the Orthopedic Foundation for Dogs, and you send in your vet will they have to anesthetize the dog because they have to lay it on its back and spread its, its legs out. Mm -hmm. So it needs to be anesthetized for the x-ray. Then they submit the x-ray to OFA and vets there will read them and they'll score them as either excellent, good, fair, or poor. And fair and poor should never be bred. Those dogs should be spayed and neutered and sold as pets. So should you be a little wary of people if they're asking hundreds of dollars for a dog and they haven't had any tests? Absolutely, absolutely. That's the number one, that's a very good indicator of whether or not they're a good breeder. And um, another thing to think about is um, that we'll talk about later when you actually go to see the breeder and one of your questions should be, and you should know the answer to this because you've already done your research, 
but one of your questions should be what kind of diseases are associated with this breed and if you hear nothing or no oh, they're very healthy or well there are some diseases but not in ours right right <laughs> turn around and run and you know <laughs> another thing too it's very good to go online if you're going to buy from somebody selling do a google search mm -hmm. it's amazing what you can find uh, that people have written in about their history of purchasing mm -hmm. from a person if they're happy if they're not happy if they feel they've been scammed yeah and and if you find a, you say you decide you want a Scottish Terrier and you, you go online and you find some websites of Scottish Terriers near you, um, look on these websites carefully and, and a good breeder will have a page on their website that talks about them and what, how long they've been involved with Scottish Terriers, how long they've been breeding them. If you don't see any names or you don't see anything like that, that can make you really suspect because remember anybody can go create a pretty web page but what what have they really done and another thing too along those same lines when you go to purchase a dog or look at a dog be sure to ask to see its parents if there's any hesitation at all mm -hmm. that's a red flag yeah yeah so after you look at the breed standard, then another thing you can do if you, if you still have your heart set on a purebred dog is there's local dog shows going on. And again, you can access the AKC site and they will have um, a calendar of events and you can see where the dog shows are and when there will be one in your Thank area. You. And if you go and just walk around, you know, these people have all their grooming stations set up outside the ring. You mentioned exercise as a requirement. Mm -hmm. um, can you talk to a little bit more about um, why that is so important? And there again, that's another thing that people just don't put enough thought process into. But I do like the fact that there are some shows on TV now that are starting to educate people. Um, Animal Planet, for mm -hmm. one, and, and going back to thinking about a breed, uh, they have a show called 101 Breeds, and they'll have, like, well, maybe one show will be Dalmatians 101, and the mm -hmm. next next show is St. Bernard's 101, but they'll give you a lot of information about that breed, the pros and cons, and they'll review some of the health issues. And then the Dog Whisper is a show that I like a lot. And if one thing you'll notice is that when he goes to um, make a house call for a problem large breed, the hunting breeds or the, the herding breeds, one of the first things you see him do is he puts on those roller skates uh -huh. and he takes that dog for a long roller skate. Then he starts his training. And it's the same thing as if you had a four or five year old child who one day was bouncing off the walls and running around the house and climbing <laughs> up on the back of the couch and jumping off. Now is not the time to sit down and get out some coloring books and try to teach them their right, ABCs. Right. right, run outside. <laughs> take him outside, take him to the park and kick around a soccer ball sure. for a half hour. Then if you brought him in, you might be able to sit down with the coloring books and actually start studying and learning the ABCs. It's the same way with the dog. When they have all that pent-up energy, yeah. you can't even begin to train them. So you have to meet that need. Exercise, exercise, <laughs> exercise. As a matter of fact, we just recorded with Heather Bent from Potter's Angels Rescue. She went out and spent a week with Caesar mm -hmm. um, as a volunteer, mm -hmm. and he was training 40 people to bring his methods back. But she just said how wonderful he is. And he walking with a pack of dogs, and mm -hmm. all these dogs were the rejects. Mm -hmm. that would have been euthanized immediately in any shelter. So it was really an interesting experience. And along the lines of exercise, there's not just the physical exercise, but there's also mental exercise, mm -hmm. particularly for the very intelligent breeds like Border Collies and many of the herding dogs and, and some of the, the sporting and hunting breeds. If you don't meet that need, if you're not giving them enough challenge mentally, then they'll start finding their own challenges mm -hmm. and usually that's something they shouldn't be doing. So you, you have to know your breed and know it very well and know what you need to do to stimulate not only not only meet their exercise requirements but to stimulate their mental capacity so that they don't get themselves into trouble because of lack of that. And one of the things that can happen, like I was just um, 
talking with some of my friends in Belgium Malinois rescue the other day and they were going to North Carolina to pick up a Belgian Malinois who was getting out of the backyard and had started attacking smaller dogs. Yeah. That is not the dog's fault at all. That dog is bored in the backyard. Mm -hmm. It's not getting enough mental stimulation. I mean, these are the dogs that are the primo police dogs. Uh, they, they are so intelligent and need to be challenged all the time mentally. So he decided that's how he was going to challenge himself. How many little <laughs> dogs can I catch and how many cats can I catch? <laughs> but that's the kind of dog that, because you know what the problem is and where it originated, now that rescue will take him and they'll rehabilitate him and teach him, no, that's not how you stimulate yourself mentally by seeing how many cats you can catch. Or how you stimulate yourself mentally is we're going to teach you agility. <laughs> and you do an agility course or something like that. And he will be able to be rehabilitated to the point that he, down the road, could even live in a home with cat. We did a show this past summer with um, a Vermont State Trooper who had one of these mm -hmm. dogs. And he, this dog, Drager, was absolutely phenomenal. You should have seen him going through his moves. And what the, the trooper explained is you use their natural mm -hmm. love of doing something, mm -hmm. their love to run, their love to catch. Mm -hmm. So for them, their work is always what mm -hmm. they love to do. They and want a job. Yeah. It, it can be protecting your family. Um, it can be competing in dock diving mm -hmm. or agility. Or, there's so many things that those kinds of breeds excel at. But if you don't do that, they're not content to sit in the backyard, right. like this woman kept him in the, he spent most of his time by himself in his backyard, he was bored stiff. And the poor dogs that are chained in the backyard, mm -hmm. oh my goodness, what a life, what a life, or kenneled, mm -hmm. you know. So tell me, is there, um, there's a difference in training different breeds, is that oh, what absolutely, you're suggesting? absolutely. Okay. And you, you hear the words, um, pack and alpha being tossed around a lot and all, all dogs do come from wolves and if we look at wolves and the hierarchy and within a wolf uh, pack that can teach you a lot about how your dog thinks and how he reasons through things there's always a leader of the pack if you watch mm -hmm. the wolves and what does that leader get as a result of being the leader well he sleeps in the best place to sleep he gets the best food to eat. So he gets to do everything first and when he wants to do it. So when you bring that puppy home and you put him in your bed, uh -huh. now he's getting to sleep in the best place to sleep with you. So that, in his mind, raises him up on the hierarchy. When you allow your dog to go, th you open a door, allow your dog to go through the door first, well, the pack leader always goes through the door first. So to your dog, you're telling them, you are the pack leader, you are above me. But well, the dog would always do that. Well, in some of the dogs that are less dominant, it doesn't matter. Well. But you have a German Shepherd, or a Belgian Malinois, or a Weimar Whammer, or a Bull Mastiff. Uh -huh. It makes a huge <laughs> difference because they are dominant breeds to begin with. Sure. And you've just told him that he is above you in this pack in your house. Therefore, he doesn't have to listen to you, and he makes all the decisions because he's the pack leader. So it's that very makes sense. oh it, it is yeah. and it's very so it's very important if, if you have one of the more dominant breeds that you learn how to send the message I am alpha and I, you are subordinate to me in this pack in our house. So tell me how would you do that with positive reinforcement, <clears throat> um, correction, or usually the um, you, you get those two terms tossed around a lot: of positive reinforcement and corrections. A lot of breeds can be trained just with positive reinforcement alone. Mm -hmm. Usually these more dominant breeds need corrections. And a correction is just having them on a lead um, with a slip choke chain and just a little jerk, just enough to get their attention, mm -hmm. hey, you don't do that, with a command, no, or sit, or whatever. Mm -hmm. and, and that is what we call a correction in the dog world. So these breeds that have a tendency, and you have to think of these breeds like 
I, I mentioned the, the working dogs a lot because that's what my background is, but why are they so dominant and why they have these tendencies? Well, look what they were bred for. Mm -hmm. They were bred to herd and make decisions. So even though maybe your German Shepherd, the last German Shepherd that actually herded sheep or was his great-great-grandfather, right, right. he still has those genes to make decisions if you allow him to be the decision maker. So being generation after generation after generation is not going to take that instinct? Not always. Sometimes it does. Mm -hmm. We do have examples of, of Labradors that have no hunting instinct. We do have examples of some of the herding breeds. But still, there's quite a few of them out there that have those dominant tendencies and still their, in, their basic instincts are intact. So if you allow them to go through the door first, that's something you should never do with a German Shepherd because the message you're sending to him is that you are subordinate to him. And so then when it comes to training, he's like, listen to her, <laughs> well, I'm the leader around here. Let me teach her a thing or two. <laughs> exactly, so then, then you'll have problems training and then that's why dogs like that end up in the shelters when the people take them there so we can't do a thing with him. Yeah. Or if you're just not a dominant person. Some people by nature are more submissive. So if you can't take that dominant lead role, then don't get that bull mastiff puppy. Mm -hmm. Because you won't be successful with him unless you can portray that kind of person. And if you can't do that, then, then pick one of the breeds that that's not a requirement. Okay, that makes sense. Um, you mentioned the AKC breed standard. Is it steadfast? No, um, and that's because of all of the overbreeding and puppy mills and backyard breeders that today there was a time where all German Shepherds would pretty much fall within that breed standard in terms of not just their looks but the temperament. All breed standards have a description of what the temperament of that breed should be, but today um, you know, like we were just talking about where there are German Shepherds that don't have a bit of alpha in them mm -hmm. and it's all been bred out. So the breed standard isn't really a steadfast, it's a good place to start, but recognize even once you select a breed there's going to be a lot of variation mm -hmm. within that breed. So it's important to talk to the breeder about what they do with the dogs, see all of their dogs, and then you'll know what the temperament is. So if we were to call American Kennel Club, would we be able to get information about a specific breeder? No. Okay. Um, and they don't have as much oversight as you think they have. Um, and even some of the breed organizations, the breed clubs, don't have as much oversight as you think they have. The, the American Kennel Club will register the dogs so that both parents have to be registered. How do you know if they're going, okay, so somebody who breeds them sends paperwork in? Right, you have an AKC registration. And how do you know that paper doesn't, hasn't been whited out with somebody else's? Well name? you can, they have a database, so you can get that information from the, if that its dog is actually in their database. Okay. But you don't know if that's corresponding to the dog that you're seeing at the right. breeder's house. Right. You know, right. So right. there's where loss of oversight is. Well, we did a cruelty investigation last winter, and the person boasted that he had AKC. He only had one paper that he showed for uh, many well, dogs. It's like, mm -hmm. well, wait a minute, what yeah. is this all about? Yeah. Okay. It's not there. You know, the half hour has just flown right by. Okay. But would you stay? I have so many more questions I'd like sure. to ask you. Feel